Many of you know that I was just in South Sudan uh, with the uh, training the chaplains there, and I was asked to teach the Book of Psalms. Billy Rutledge was, was with me, and he was teaching Ephesians. And obviously, anytime you go on a trip like that, it's, it's, it's amazing everything that happens. Now, many of you were praying for me, and, and Olgi was in Hungary, I was in South Sudan. And we could feel the power of this prayer, so thank you very much. I'm really serious about this because it, it was tough. I mean, it was 33 degrees Celsius up to 37 degrees. I, I think that's 95-ish, 97 degrees every day, humid. And at nighttime, it wasn't too much cooler. And so it's like those old days. You guys are too young to remember uh, going to sleep without air conditioning. How many remember going to sleep without air conditioning? Look at all you guys, all right? And no, 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 no. That's only Pastor Mark says that. I'm saying that you just um, have a good memory, that's all. So that was, those were the days, my friend. We thought they'd never end, right? Yes. Now, uh, you know, I told some of you that I thought that this was, you know, I've traveled a lot with the magazine over the many years. Uh, of course, I'm a little bit older now doing this traveling, but it, it, it was some of the hardest that I've ever done. Uh, and, but it was the most rewarding too, and that happens so often, you know, some of the hardest things are some of the best things. So praise the Lord for our amazing country that we live in. You know, we just don't appreciate America like we need to. It's, you know, you go over there and, um, you know, a masses of humanity are living in difficult and sometimes horrible and almost seemingly inhumane conditions. And, you know, people, but the most important thing is people are over there sharing the gospel. And uh, South Sudan is a Christian nation, but like a lot of Africa, it's, it's Christianity is an inch deep and a thousand miles wide. It's just they need to learn more. And so hence, that's why they need Bible teachers over there. Um, but last year, because back in 2019, I was asked by Wes Bentley, who was here. Do you guys remember when he was here? How many were here? It was a month ago now that Wes was here. So you guys saw when he was here, and, uh, and he kind of gave an update of what was going on there. Um, and uh, so I was, had the first 50, oh, and we're gonna, anybody uh, that needs a Bible, if you wanna come on, Terry, you want, anybody need a Bible? We, we are, go, are gonna go into Psalm 23 here. So if you need a Bible, raise your hand, and Terry will put one in your hand here. There we go. By the way, do we have any visitors, first-time visitors here? No? Oh, that's right, yeah. So, we have a first-time visitor there too, Terry. You got to go. Okay, good to go. It's good when all the groundwork has already been done, amen? Um, so, he asked me, and I'm like, okay, Wes, I'm editor of the magazine. Um, I have taught occasionally here, and not very well in my estimation, you know? And... Uh, so I, he just felt like the Lord was saying to have me go and teach the Psalms, maybe because of my missionary experience of covering the different things. I managed to get through 33 books of Psalms, and I was happy with that. I was given the task of 50, but we were in Calvary Chapel. We go line upon line, verse upon verse, right? And it took that long to, uh, to work through those. Uh, you know, we're saying they can fire me, you know? <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know? So it was a good, it was great, and just to be with these men, that uh, it's just incredible. Pastor Billy Rutledge, you know him. It's a friend from Calvary Chapel in the Harris Islands. Uh, he was with me. He taught through the Book of Ephesians, and many of you know that Billy has been suffering with cancer for quite a few, four years now, and his back is broken. But he continues to teach around the world because he he wants kind of die with his boots on. You know, he's, he was only given a life expectancy uh, four years ago, between three and five years with the type of cancer that he has. Um, of course, a lot of people are praying for him, and, but he travels around. He goes to Russia. He goes to the Philippines. He, he goes into some tough areas to, uh, to, to teach. But he said this was the toughest that he's ever experienced just because of the way that it's set up there. Um, now, Neither of us realized that we wouldn't have a translator. 
we thought for sure, and I'm kind of used to teaching through a translator when it goes, and when I'm in Hungary and I teach there, and it gives you time to look at your notes, and you can really expound upon it, you know, you spring out. But no, and there was also a marine-style drill instructor, Sam, who I became good friends with, but 50 feet away, the, the room that we were in had no walls. I mean, it, was, it had a roof over it, but it was wide open. And, and Sam, the drill instructor, was screaming, uh, marine st uh, style, like up at Quantico, uh, every time these guys would make a mistake, which seemed like every half minute there was a mistake made. And they were learning how to march and drill. Now, these chaplains will soon be integrated into the South Sudanese Army. Uh, and this Calvary Chapel is mission's goal uh, with far-reaching ministries for these gun-carrying chaplains is to be better trained as they're going to be integrated in, um, into the, uh, the regular army. And they want the chaplains to be better trained, really, than the military so they will stand out like people, so people will notice these guys, that these guys, you know, they know how to march, they're, they're disciplined, and, uh, and this is a pretty undisciplined country. You know, they've been at war for the lives of most of these people. Uh, almost everybody I talk to their whole lives, there's been war in their country. Now, as Wes shared here, when he was here before, the army, cha army chaplains, uh, the armed chaplains uh, from Calvary Chapel have been able to stand off and fight off murderous terrorists like Boko Haram. And if you remember uh, another fellow that was there, that they rampage through the villages committing terrible atrocities. Um, so there's a reason that these men are armed because they are there to protect women and children at all costs. And they are dedicated to giving up their lives to save any women or children that are threatened. Now, their day began, and th there's a group there that was all, had graduated already, and they were training just military style. Who Billy and I were teaching were the chaplains in training. This is a year-long program they have there. Their day begins at 5 a.m., and PT, physical training, at 6 a.m. till breakfast, and then Billy would teach uh, uh, three 50-minute sessions at 9, 10, 11. They would eat lunch, and then at 2 p.m., when they are so tired and exhausted with the heat, then it's my turn. And I'm telling you, you know, the first day, I'm like, how am I going to teach these guys? You know, they're, they're, I can just tell they're so exhausted, you know. So I had to wake them up. You know, we did some songs, and they, they got a kick of me leading them in some songs. And then if they were really sleepy, I get down with them, and we do 25 push-ups. And I noticed they were allowing them to do push-ups from their knees. And I'm like, man, you're not going to do sissy push-ups around me. We're going to do full push-ups. I get down with them, we do 25, and they, they thought they got a kick out of the old guy doing the push-ups with them. So now by the end of the middle of the second teaching, in the middle of the second teaching, Billy and I's voice was strained because construction was going on. Wes is building a seven-story building to house visitors coming in. Uh, it's kind of like a stopping point for Christians coming from across the country. Um, so you're going to see a bit in the video coming up here. Um, I, I allow, my wife saw it today and she thought it was pretty funny hearing me sing and lead these guys so anyway and they asked me every morning or every afternoon when it was my turn they wanted to sing the line of Judah and so uh, I remember Ken Graves singing that so some of you guys know who he is so, so even through this intensity of teaching I was overwhelmed with God's goodness and grace to allow me to serve these men and teach them the Bible. Who am I? You know, I'm just but a willing vessel. That's all. Once I was called, I'm going, okay, I'm going to go for it and do the best I can. Now, 18 of these 70 chaplains in training were actually already pastors in Uganda, and they had been given permission to come in, but they, had, they didn't know when they came they would have to go through all this PT either. They thought they were just going to come there and learn the Bible, and they complain when they first got there, but they said, okay, we, we, it's worth learning more about God's word. So these guys were already pastors and have been pastoring. So what a privilege I had, but I felt that responsibility too, so I wanted every minute to count with them. Um, some of the men struggled to understand English. Their primary language uh, was Arabic, but about three-fourths of them understood it well. Uh, some of them, when things I could tell that if people didn't understand things. I asked them to translate it to be sure they caught on. 
So now, Wes Bentley, when he was here, you just see him and everything. But while he's busy in the States doing things, his wife, Vicky, is over in South Sudan. She teaches 10 women's Bible studies each week and a lot of ad hoc, just or added on too. So we'll, you'll see a picture of her. And I mean, the, this, these, group, these people are going for it. Their goal is to, that South Sudan would, would be a country of believers in the middle of Africa. It's landlocked now since the, uh, they fought against uh, Khartoum and the, and the country of Sudan to, um, to get away from them. Um, so your resources, if you're supporting them, are impacting in this new country, and the gospel is being spread in a mighty way. Now, just to show you how the cultural differences were, were when I was teaching, I, you know, I was mostly talking about King David's life, and I said his life was a roller coaster, you know, up and down. And they looked at me, roller coaster. And they said, I said, yeah, um, you've never seen a roller coaster. Carnivals? No. Uh, have you seen American movies? Well, none of them had ever seen a movie. The only movie they had ever, ever, had ever seen was the Jesus movie, movie that a, a missionary had brought and shown on their wall in, in the evening. So like, wow, this is so different. And it's just, just an amazing difference in what our backgrounds are and what we know, you know. So we're going to work through the psalm, one of the psalms that was their favorite that has impacted on their life. Uh, we're going to work through one of those in a bit. Um, but first, we're going to uh, look through some photos right here. And we're going to pull up the JPEGs for the slideshow. And you guys tell me when it's behind me, because I'm looking. But it's not up front. It's not. Oh, wait, oh, is that the first one? OK. Is that the first one? Go back to the first one, please. I was expecting to see it on this screen. There we go. It's a, we got to lighten this up a little bit, but you'll notice that this is when, you'll see this in the video when we first came. Wait, can you, can you go back, please? <laughs> Don't go till I tell you, if, unless, unless it moves. Uh, just, they were just singing so happy in this house. Uh, the women had lost this, uh, their church. And the women built, uh, baked the bricks themselves, which they do in that village, and they had uh, put these walls up, and it's a dirt floor, but the ceiling, there we go, you got it there, thank you. Uh, the ceiling, they didn't have a ceiling, they didn't have a roof. So far reaching, uh, saw their need there and supplied the roof. And the women that are so happy, uh, you'll see a picture here in a second on, uh, what, on what the church looks like from outside. I'm sorry, now you can go ahead and change that. And that's just in, uh, they just have a little mat there and they're just praising God and just, just so happy when Vicky came to teach them the word. They're so hungry to hear the word of God. It was really, I, I didn't expect it to be quite as different as it was when I got out of the car. I was like, whoa, this is, this is, <laughs> this is really different here. You can change the next one, please. Okay, and that's Vicki Bentley there on the left, of course, and she's teaching through the translator. Um, this, we're across the border. The, the camp, the far-reaching camp, is right on the border of Uganda and South Sudan, like five minutes off the border. So a lot of what they do is in Uganda as well, and that's south. And the crazy thing is in Uganda, they drive on the left side of the road. In South Sudan, they drive on the right side of the road. So you're driving, all of a sudden you cross the border, you switch, and it's just, it's, it's really pretty crazy, you know. It's a, so you can go to the next one, I'm sorry. Okay, just in the, the ladies listening to the teaching. Okay, next one. Vicky again, and from behind with the, the translator. Go ahead and neck again, please. Now, what do you do when a, when a chicken crosses in front of, of you? You shoot it, right? You shoot it with your camera. So, uh, so yeah, that's all. You mean, because you know you're kind of in a country situation when a chicken just kind of walks in, checks it out, walks back and forth. Uh, I was able to get one shot before it uh, flew away on me there. It was strutting across. And no one paid attention. And I'm like, look, there's a chicken. <laughs> so but, so um, you can switch. Next one, please. Now, notice this right here. 
if you can see the, the dove that they drew up there, this is Calvary Chapel of Bibia. This is the church that the women built um, and the roof that Far Reaching put on. That's the pastor right there, Taban Ronald. But notice the service times. Can you see what the service time says? That's one service. We're going to talk to Mark about increasing our times, you know, just kind of going for three and a half hours, a lot more worship and some, you know, well, maybe not, you know, so, yeah. So, but just they, after the service, they gather out there. I was just really struck by this, and they, they knew that it had to have a dove, so they did their best to paint the dove, and it just was just really sweet for me to see that, and, uh, and you'll see when I first got out of the car, when we hit the video of what we were met with, because they were just excited that Bible teachers were coming. Next slide, please. Now, this is the type of little homes that the people live in. Uh, there are no jacuzzis, no running water. Uh, there is a little bit of solar electricity in some of them. But I don't know if this one did or not, but it's pretty, and with the heat, it's pretty rough, pretty rough living. Next one, please. Okay, this is the ladies cooking breakfast. Uh, they, you guys can, they're, they're baking it in boiling oil and kind of making a bread. They have tea uh, there and, uh, and then some kind of bread. Next one, please. Okay, this, what, this is uh, someone that fell asleep during when I was teaching. He sat, he's right outside the door right there. Now, this is Sam, the drill instructor. And uh, actually, he had fallen, this guy had fallen asleep in my class. I wasn't expecting the drill instructor to grab him out of my class, but he did. So, no, this was, this was another time. Um, but this is the kind of intense drill that these guys are getting. I mean, it is, it, it's, it's pretty tough. And uh, so they are being pushed to their limits because they're expected to be a better, higher grade of uh, a soldier once they enter into the... South Sudanese Army. Next slide, please. Uh, this is kind of the compound, and you, you, if you can notice in the far right, they have the uh, walls there, that you know the gates that are brought open, and uh, there are gun turrets at every one. Th this facility has been bombed several times uh, during the fighting. You know, someone has, was lobbing um, RPGs over into the uh, rocket-propelled grenades over into the facility. Uh, no one was killed, but they were after them. And the little place that we taught was straight across there. You can see it has an, uh, two floors right there. And they, um, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I was really concerned when I saw that statue. I'm like, I'm praying that's not West Bentley statue. It wasn't. It was an African man holding a Bible and a gun. And that's what, you know, that's, so it was an African. Next slide, please. So Saturdays. I was told that we could teach on Saturdays. But Saturdays is the time that they, you know, clean their clothes. So that's behind the facility there. And you see the, you see the walls back there. Next one, please. And so you see how they are set up there for an attack. And the walls, and they, they clean all the time, keeping it clean. Next one, please. Um, for some reason, they have crocodiles there, I mean, in the facility. <laughs> And so this man's job was to feed the crocodiles. I noticed he was doing it through a fence. I, I think that's wise. But it's, you're in Africa, so you have crocodiles. So next one, please. Um, now, one of these cows was soon no longer with us because Hatteras uh, Island Christian Fellowship, I didn't even think about this before I went, but um, Billy knew that it's, you know, with what they eat, they don't, you know, it's kind of a, um, um, a corn maize for lunch and beans and for dinners, corn maize and beans, and that's it. So Billy's church, Hatteras Island Christian Fellowship, bought a cow for $500. So on that Saturday night, we were there that um, th they could, they slaughtered a cow and had the cow for dinner. The next picture, please. Should... There you go. There's that cow being put into the big pots, and it fed like 170 people that were there. So, and that's my buddy Sam. But then that's another Sam. There was a couple, quite a few Sams, but he runs the kitchen. Next one, please. 
Okay, that's me way back there. See, I, I'm a photographer, but Billy's, you know, I have to kind of work with him a little bit there. That's a long ways away, but that's me up there. That's the man teaching um, somewhere there. There's me standing up there. And uh, so it was a big class. I don't think anyone's sleeping in the back there. Next one, please. There I am, my back. So, but you, but you notice I have my handy notebook in my back right pocket as usual. And it has many of your names in, my, in that notebook, by the way. So that's my class. And it looks like I'm leading an orchestra, which I'm not. But, um, but the men, especially the front row guys, they were, they were tuned in. Next one, please. Okay, drilling, drilling, drilling every day. Next one, please. There's Sam. He's kind of a guy who made a few mistakes, and his cover is off. I, I said, you don't have your hat. He said, it's called a cover. He straightened me out on that. Next one, please. Uh, then the men lining up for formation. Next one, please. And there's Billy Rutledge from the, from the backside, you know, just showing up front to the class. Next one, please. Oop, that was cut off a lot. No sense messing. Next one, please. I think, I think that's a vertical. That's a problem. Uh, and then some of the guys in, in my class, and Billy's class too, is the same class, obviously. Next one, please. And here's Billy. Um, and the men, you know, he, uh, he was asked to wear a chap. He's a Coast Guard chaplain. And he asked the U.S. Coast Guard if he could wear his chaplain's uniform there. And they said no. So when he, they, when he got, when we got there, they asked him if he would wear it. So that's a far-reaching ministry's chaplain's uniform. I'm not a chaplain, so I, I never wanted to, you know, wear one. I'm, it wouldn't be right. So, but Billy is. So he's teaching uh, the men. I think this is our next to last day teaching. And there he is after class. And guys, everybody shakes hand. And in South Sudan, you do a straight shake like a bro shake from the 60s, then a straight shake again, and you got to shake hands. Even when you walk in to get your passport stamp, you got to shake hands with everybody in the, in, that's in the building, it seems like. So you just do it. You know. So next one, please. And uh, yeah, so that's just a couple guys had their arms around Billy. And I think that's my, another Samuel right there. Next one, please. We're almost at the end, and that's... Uh, this guy was, he's a pastor, and just, and this is just one of these guys listening. Just, you know, they're tuned in and focused and trying to get everything of what we're saying. So I really did feel the responsibility of teaching these men. Next one, please. Um, Billy has cancer. And is this one, is he standing up? Let me see. Yeah, he's standing on a chair right there. And all the men, before we left, this is the last day, wanted to pray for Billy and lay hands on him. So he's standing on a chair just saying, you know, whether the Lord keeps him here, he just want, he's praying that he can keep going, teaching, until the Lord takes him home. And it's where the men are praying that he would be able to uh, come back. Uh, they didn't pray that for me, that I would come back. So No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, so this is, you'll see a couple pictures in succession here. He talked, every, all the ch guys in training wanted to gather around him and pray for him. So even uh, Sam and the kind of the drill instructors were praying. There we go, and then a little close-up of Billy there. Okay, next one. Uh, yeah, and then finally Billy's finished. And okay, well you can keep that. Uh, you can let that one go down, but we'll bring that one back up in a second if we can. Um, we'll 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 tell this man's story in a little bit. You know, why don't we go ahead right now and uh, quickly uh, play the video so you can get an idea of the sounds and what it's like. I was asked by Wes Bentley to come to South Sudan. I'm taking photos, I'm doing video for the Calvary Chapel magazine. 
But more specifically, Wes asked me to come and teach the book of Psalms. You know, in America, we teach people how to live for Christ. And what I realized in the Sudan, South Sudan, you're also teaching people how to die for Christ. Because these men that are in the chaplain's corps have spent a whole lifetime of fighting, of struggle, have endured many hardships. Their country has been at war. Keep your right forward! Nobody said look that way! When you're going through your PT, your, your physical training every morning, do you feel like God is with you? Or are you saying, God, where are you? Uh, where, God, where are you? And Sam is yelling in your ear. <laughs> and you're going like, Lord, help me. For the baptism that says to all of the world, as these people would come and give their lives to Christ, many of them being killed, many of them being imprisoned, many of them having their lands taken. Now baptism was something different. Now when you went and you were baptized. In America, I serve as a support chaplain with the U.S. Coast Guard. And so when I arrived, they actually said, hey, listen, we want you to teach in a uniform. The uh, South Sudanese uh, Army uniform that they wear, but it's very uncomfortable for me because I've never suffered like these men. I've never taken the risk that these men have taken. You think you're coming to teach something and you really get schooled here about what it means to be a man of God, to still worship, to still love, to still have joy when you have nothing but a long resume of suffering and pain and injury. And then to walk away realizing, okay, that's what it looks like to run the race. That's what it looks like to endure hardship and still be in love with Jesus. It'll change your life. It'll cause you to come home and be a thankful person. And a thankful person walks much different than the typical American who's always caught up with wanting more. You realize you really don't need more of things what we need is more of Jesus. This is an incredible investment, bringing an entire country to Jesus. Vicki Bentley goes out each week and does a minimum of 10 Bible studies with women's groups. Wherever there's a need, wherever there's a desire, she will go and teach the women. And it's been amazing. I got to go with her and watch them do that. What's the, what's the most important commandment and yes. how do I inherit eternal life? No, I'm just you know exactly what the man was doing. But Jesus did not waste his time arguing. A church that was built uh, by the women, they made the bricks themselves, they put up the walls. They didn't have money for a roof. And Wes and Vicki, they donated that. And they are thrilled to have their own church. The floor is, d is dirt, but they don't care. They're praising God and glorifying God. Uh, through the entire uh, time they're there. So I take this back to America to say, if you're supporting far-reaching ministries, that is certainly, without a doubt, a worthwhile investment. This country is being changed here for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through it all, these people have joy. Through it all, they have hope. They don't walk around despondent. They don't walk around in depression. They actually are hopeful because they actually believe there's a God who's in control. And at the end of all things, the end of losing family members, the end of having their bodies wounded continually by bullets and shrapnel, at the end of all this, Jesus Christ is King and Lord. And that's what they trust in. We will leave with that indelible mark on our hearts that we've walked among men and women who have been thrown into lion's den. And yet they just keep praying. They just keep praising. They just keep living for God in the midst of struggle and suffering. I came to teach what I was taught about what it means to truly love God through all circumstances. God bless. May we finish as well 
as our South Sudanese brothers and sisters are finishing. Amen. Turn to Psalm 23, please. Now this psalm has had a great impact on the lives of the men that we taught. Um, you know, they've gone through so much. They've lived through war. They've lived through hardship. They've lived through famine. Uh, and uh, so they know, and they have used this as pastors too, the ones that were pastors, um, to impact uh, with people going through severe trials or suffering illness or some even dying. Um, we talked about that for some people that they, these, these verses in Psalm 23 may have been the last words they heard on this side of eternity. Now this, this was a Psalm of David. You know, he was a shepherd. He, was, probably, he probably wrote this as a king, but he was not ashamed of his former uh, what he was before. And uh, so he starts out saying, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As David thought about God and his relationship with God, he likened it to a shepherd and a sheep. God was like a shepherd to David, and David a sheep to God. By the way, South Sudan, they raise a lot of cattle. They don't have, it's an agrarian society, so they understand a lot of this. Now, Isaiah 40, 11 tells us that the Lord will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. In Micah 7, 14, it Invites the Lord to shepherd your people with your staff, as in days of old. In Psalm 28, 9, David invited the Lord to shepherd the people of Israel and to bear them up forever. Zechariah 13, 7 speaks of the Messiah as a shepherd who will be struck and the sheep scattered. Quoted in Matthew 26, 31. Actually, we'll read that right here. And Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it's written... I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. So we're going to skip down a little bit. Now, if a family needed a shepherd, it was always the youngest son, like David, who got the nasty job. Now, I think to me the sweetest word in this is the word my, because it says God is my shepherd. He cares for me. He watches over me. He preserves me. Now, David knew that he needed a shepherd. The heart of this psalm doesn't connect with those that feel they're self-sufficient, that they don't need anybody or anything. But those who truly sense their need, as Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, the poor in spirit, they find great comfort in the idea that God can be a shepherd to them in a personal, very personal sense. Now, we know that a sheep is a very uh, foolish and sluggish creature ready to wander, um, do any of you find it easy to wander away from God? It's easy when things are going well, isn't it, to kind of kind of forget about our prayer time and not be uh, on, our, on our knees, on our face, seeking the Lord when things are going well. Then the next verse says, I shall not want. For David, the fact of God's shepherd-like care of him meant, meant that all of his needs were supplied by the Lord, our shepherd. He makes me to lie down. The Lord, as a shepherd, knew how to make David rest when he needed it, just as a literal shepherd would take care of his sheep, to lie down in green pastures. The shepherd also knew the good places to make his sheep rest. Rest comes because the shepherd has dealt with the concerns of the sheep, like fear, like flies, like famine. He leads me beside the still waters. The shepherd knows when the sheep needs the green pastures, and he knows when he needs the still waters. This gives the sheep the sense of comfort, of care, and of the rest that's needed. He restores my soul. The tender care of the shepherd described in the previous verse had its intended effect. David's soul was 
restored by the green pastures and still waters. Restores has the idea of the rescue of a lost one. Remember how the Lord gave us the picture of the shepherd leaving the 99 to search for the one that was lost. Luke 15, 4 says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? He leads me. The shepherd was a guide. The shepherd didn't need to know where the green pastures or still waters were. All he needed to know is where the shepherd was to keep his eyes focused on the shepherd. And that's what we need to do is keep our eyes focused on the good shepherd. And the Lord will guide us to where we need to be. Now, in the past of righteousness, the leadership of the shepherd did not only comfort and restore David, he also guides him morally into an area of what is right. For his name's sake, the shepherd guides in the glory of his grace and not on account of any merit or anything that we have done. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, this is the first sign of trouble in this very peaceable psalm here, isn't it? Yet, when following the Lord as shepherd, one may still, and we know we all will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, one of the men in leadership at Far Reaching Ministries, Lino Mayol, that's the picture that was up there, if you wouldn't mind, if you can still flash his picture up. He grew up in his personal valley of death in South Sudan and has been fighting the enemy since he was 14 years old. Islamic military units from the north from North Sudan swept down from Khartoum, raping and killing as they rampaged through the south. His family's income was de deprived solely on cattle they raised, and the soldiers stole all the cattle and then raped and killed people in his village. And then at 15, he joined the Sudanese People Liberation Army to fight these marauders coming down and taking all their goods away. Now, through many battles, he was wounded three times. You can see the scars he showed Billy and I when we pressed him. And his family were strong believers. He he'd finally joined the chaplain's corps in 1999. He told me he's 49 now, and I find it hard to believe. He looks so young to me. But he says he'll turn 50 next year. So he said the Lord gave him confidence through his word as he studied his word and read his word. Before each encounter with the enemy... He relied on God's word when the Lord encouraged him to be brave and courageous. Depending on what Paul said, he knew that absent from the body, he would be present with the Lord. And he said, this is the only way to go into battle. Now consider that this is a valley of the shadow. Catch that word there, the shadow of death. It's the shadow of death casting its dread, its horror across David's path. But it's the shadow. It's not, not, not the death itself. David recognized that under the shepherd's leading, he may walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It isn't his destination or a place to stay, but it's the conscious presence of the Lord as shepherd that makes it bearable. So read this line with your thoughts to Jesus, the great shepherd. We understand that a shadow is not real, but is cast by something that is real. If we've accepted the free gift of salvation from Christ, we can say we face only the shadow of death because Jesus withstood the full power of death in our place. Amen? Jesus on the cross, he took all our sins, past, present, and future, on his back. And that is we are now. If we accept that free gift of salvation... The sting of death is gone. Death no longer has power over us. Yes, we may leave this earth and we lose loved ones and it's painful for us. But if they are walking with Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the sting of death is gone because we will see them again. Amen? It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death. This line from Psalms and the psalm as a whole has proven itself precious to many, many a dying believer. The saint still calmly walks. He does not need to quicken his pace in alarm or panic. Near death, the saint does not walk in the valley, but through the valley. There is a difference. I will fear no evil. 
despite every bad connection with the idea of the valley of the shadow of death, David could say this because he was under the care of the Lord, his shepherd, even though in a fearful place, the presence, presence of, the, of the shepherd mutes or stifles the fear of evil. And notice that the shepherd's presence did not eliminate the presence of evil, but it certainly should remove the fear of evil. For you are with me. This emphasizes that it is the presence of the shepherd of the shepherd that eliminates the fear of evil for the sheep. And the same goes for us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff are instruments used by the shepherd. The idea of a sturdy walking stick used to gently prod, maybe sometimes a little harder, guide his sheep. So we all prefer the gentle prodding, don't we, than the little hard, harsher prodding that I have oftentimes waited for. And it's not worth it, that's for sure. Now, this, these were a comfort to David. It helped him, even in the valley of the shadow of death, to know that God guided him, even through correction. It's a great comfort to know that God will correct us when we need it. Now, listen to this. He says, you prepare a table before me. Now, David envisioned the provision and goodness given by the Lord as a host, inviting David to a rich, rich full table prepared for him. So this, in the second part of the Psalms, this magnificent banquet uh, is laid out, and it kind of shows what the Lord has for us uh, when we come into his presence. Now, as I told you, Hatteras Island paid the $500 to slaughter a cow, and then on Monday is when I taught this psalm. So I had a great word picture to go for because I could talk about what was going on on Saturday night as they enjoyed it, having meat for the first time in a long time. They were delighted that evening. Um, It made it really easy for me. Now, in the presence of my enemies, the goodness and care suggested by the prepared table is set right in the midst, in the presence of my enemies. The host's care and concern doesn't eliminate the presence of my enemies, but it enables us to experience God's goodness and bounty, even in the midst of any trials. All of these chaplains' training grew up in the shadow of death with war and its atrocities all around and in the midst of their enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Despite the dangers about the presence of the enemy, David enjoyed the richness of his host's goodness. He was refreshed by head anointed with oil. His cup was filled to the brim. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The host of the Lord's care brought the goodness and mercy of God to David, and he lived in the expectation of a continuing all the days of his life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The psalm ends with the calmest assurance that he would enjoy the presence of the Lord forever, both in his days and on this earth beyond. I will invite the worship team to come on up and get set up here as we kind of finish up here. In the Old Testament world, to eat and to drink at someone's table created a a bond, a mutual loyalty, and was intimate. So to be God's guest uh, was to be more than an acquaintance, invited for a day. It's to live with God. That is why we look forward to our potlucks here at Calvary Chapel Fredericksburg because that's a time that we can commune together as we eat over a meal. And this is such a powerful and reassuring psalm. Um, After meeting these men who had been involved in war from the time of of their earliest memories and understanding how this psalm impacted, impacted on them really has made this psalm truly impact on me. So I thank you for the opportunity to share. We're gonna pray right now. So, Lord, we come before you, and as I'm sharing with my family here at Calvary Chapel, Fredericksburg, Lord, I I remember, I see the eyes, I see the smiles, I see the faces of the many men that I got to, I had the the privilege to, um, to, to, to teach, to share, and as Billy said in the video, is we went to teach, but we were taught ourselves. We learned so much about you, about your grace, your mercy, your love, your loving kindness. Uh, Lord, you allowed us to go there and come back 
Uh, Lord, what a blessing it is to be back home. But thank you for this incredible memory I will always take with me. Thank you for uh, allowing us to, to uh, go to different lands and, and to have the privilege to teach and to reach out in your holy name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.